everyone. Is this actually, I think I'm louder than the microphone. Um, but I'm going to hold it anyway, because we have it. So hello, everyone. Welcome to the September 2023 Legacies and Lunch, a hybrid program of the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies. I am Heather Register Zabinden, the programs and website coordinator for the Bobby L. Roberts Library of Arkansas History and Art at the Central Arkansas Library System. So until December of 2024, um, we're going to be here at UA Little Rock downtown, and like always, I want to thank Marta and Emily um, for letting us use this facility for the program while the main library is being renovated. If you want to sign up for our email list and get information about all the programs that we are doing at the Roberts Library, the stuff the Butler Center is doing, the stuff the Encyclopedia of Arkansas is doing, our art program, everything, then you can either see me or Madeline here in person, or you can go to robertslibrary.org um, to sign up directly. That's probably the easiest. And then I don't mess up anybody's name when I'm typing it in. Um, please consider donating to the Cows Foundation to support the programs of the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies and the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. You can go to robertslibrary.org or encyclopediaofarkansas.net to give a one-time or monthly recurring donation. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's talk is being live streamed to YouTube, right, Dre? We were live, okay, good. Um, and available to view at Cal's YouTube channel immediately following the program, so there's no delay. You can go rewatch it again. Today's speaker will answer questions at the end of the session, and for folks on Zoom, you're just going to type your questions in the chat box like we've done for about three years now, and I'll read them aloud during the Q&A. Folks in person, I'll give you the mic, and you can ask them yourself. Um, and for folks attending in person, please silence your cell phones. I'll appreciate that. Okay, so now, what you're really here for, not all my announcements, Today, we are joined by John Rodriguez to talk about the destruction of slavery in Arkansas. He is a professor of history at Stonehill College in Easton, Massachusetts. That's where he is. I know I tricked y'all to come in person, but he is in Massachusetts. He is the author of Reconstruction in the Cane Fields from Slavery to Free Labor in Louisiana's Sugar Parishes. 1862 to 1880, and Lincoln and Reconstruction. He's also the co-author of the volumes, of one of the volumes in a series, Freedom, a documentary history of emancipation, 1661, sorry, 1861 to 1867. I knew I was going to get the date wrong. Um, please give John a warm in-person and virtual welcome. Okay, uh, thank you, Heather. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a moment and, and put myself on the screen and then I will uh, refer back um, to uh, the maps uh, as necessary. Um, I wanna thank you all uh, for attending, uh, either those who are in person or uh, attending virtually. Thank you for attending and, and showing you know interest in my work. It's always nice to have an audience uh, to be able to talk about one's work. Um, I apologize for not being there um, in person. I would very much prefer to be there in person. I don't, I do miss the South. I used to live there. I don't miss the heat so much, but I, I would very much prefer to be in person. But I guess the alternative to this is not me being there in person, but there not being any event at all. So I'd much rather do this than not. Um, I have to admit, I feel like something of an interloper uh, speaking before about Arkansas history, before an Arkansas audience, uh, many members of whom will be much better versed in Arkansas than, than I am. I feel pretty comfortable talking about Louisiana, but Arkansas may be not quite as familiar. So I do feel like I'm kind of um, inter interloping here. Um, th this presentation um, uh, on the destruction of slavery in Arkansas is part of the larger project, which I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware of, of my recent book, and I'm going to hold it up since I don't have um, 
an image of it in my presentation, but Freedom's Crescent, uh, the destruction of slavery in the lower Mississippi Valley uh, during uh, the Civil War. Um, in talking about, you know, book talks, there's basically two modes uh, in talking about one, one's book. Uh, you either kind of approach it from the perspective that the audience has either already read the book or will read the book. And so you don't want to just regurgitate the contents. And it's more about the background, how I got interested in this. Um, the other one is the assumption that most of the audience realistically has not read or will not have the opportunity to read the book. And so they're there to hear about the book and maybe learn a little bit something. Um, and I guess I'm going to try to combine both of those approaches, talk a little bit about the, the background, but but focus mostly on the on the contents um, of the book. So what I'm gonna do um, is there's gonna be four kind of parts as it were to my presentation. I'm just gonna give a, a kind of overall description um, of the project, what I'm trying to do in, in, in its broadest perspectives. Uh, then the second part is I will talk about the two main um, themes um, or, or, or points that I'm putting forward in this book. And that will really probably be the bulk of the presentation. Uh, then thirdly, I do want to focus at least on some of the, um, you know, particularly uh, distinctive elements that pertain to Arkansas um, as part of this larger project on the lower Mississippi Valley. And then fourthly, um, I do want to talk about just some of the larger implications and consequences of what I'm, what I'm trying to do um, with, uh, with this book. So let me go ahead and re-engage the map. Um, and preview quit. Are you, are you able to see the map? Yes. Well, not right now. No, oh, but you were, okay, because it told me that it, it had, it had, the preview had quit. Um, let me go ahead. Okay, yeah, run it again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, you're familiar with this. Oh, there's Arkansas up in the upper left. Uh, this is uh, the, the lower Mississippi Valley. Um, okay. So what I'm doing, the book overall is, um, it, it is a study of the destruction of slavery, emancipation, and abolition in the lower Mississippi Valley uh, from 1860 to, uh, with the election of Abraham Lincoln uh, until the final ratification of the 13th Amendment in December of 1865. I do have a, a, um, a chapter that provides the antebellum background, which I give the kind of rough overview of the history of this period before the period in question. And then I also kind of give my take on the antebellum South, slavery, the master-slave relationship. But the main part of the story uh, picks up with the election of Lincoln in 18, uh, November of 1860 and ends almost exactly five years later in early December of 65 with the amendment. I have an epilogue that jumps ahead to the um, um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, riot, the race riots in New Orleans and, and, um, and Memphis uh, in the spring of 1866 as a way of kind of bringing the, bringing the thing to a close and previewing the reconstruction period. But it's basically dealing with the war and the immediate post-war period. And so, as this map indicates, I'm I'm looking at the four states of this uh, of this uh, of this uh, of of this region, the Lower Mississippi Valley, um, and I'm focusing on the four states that seceded and joined the Confederacy. Obviously, Arkansas, Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana. In more geographical terms, I'm kind of dealing with the the Lower Mississippi Valley, the confluence of the Ohio River. Um, and the Mississippi uh, and the Mississippi River, so incorporating a little bit of Kentucky uh, and Missouri, uh, and I do incorporate developments in those states as necessary in order to understand what's going on um, in this region. Um, and I do also uh, incorporate events in in Washington D.C. and in, in the North at large um, as necessary. In a way, I mean, all kind of geographical studies, I guess, in in some way, are somewhat contrived. Um, it might sound a little bit egotistical or, or hubristic maybe, but in thinking about this project, one of the things that that kind of guided me or are used as an example, uh, some of you may be familiar with Tim Timothy Snyder's book, Bloodlands, a completely different era and topic, uh, but a study of, of the Second World War where he looks at Eastern Europe 
um, in the area between the Baltic and the Black Sea, an area where millions of people were killed uh, before and during the Second World War. And he looks at this area as a distinct geographical uh, region. And so in a way, I was kind of thinking along those lines um, in, in this work, pulling together uh, you know, these disparate pieces and putting it into, um, um, into a, um, a more or less coherent um, study. Um, I don't think it's too contrived in my case, though, because I think Americans, I mean, who can deny the importance of the Mississippi River uh, to American history and American development? And Americans in the 19th century did have an understanding of the Mississippi Valley or the lower Mississippi Valley as a distinct region. So I'm looking at this region as a, as a geo, geopolitical uh, whole, as it were. And what I'm doing is I'm attempting to pull together uh, into a coherent narrative uh, the main uh, military developments, uh, the political developments uh, um, in all four states and in Washington, uh, D.C. Um, I'm also trying to incorporate the labor component, the, the dismantling of labor, uh, of, of, of slavery as a social system, a labor system, a way of life, uh, incorporating uh, the new you know, scholarship on the destruction of slavery, of which I have been a part in, in, in my previous work. Um, and so it's an attempt to pull all of these things together into a coherent narrative. Um, as, as many of you know, there is a universe of scholarship um, on all of these aspects of the civil war and emancipation in this region. But remarkably, this book, a book like this hasn't been done before. There's no one single book that attempts to look at the process of abolition um, and emancipation in, um, in this, looking at this region as a, coherent, uh, as a coherent region. In a way, I started working on this book in the summer of 2012, and in many respects, it evolved out of my previous book on Lincoln and Reconstruction. Um, as I say, I think in the introduction, though, I mean, kind of without really even realizing it, I've been working on this book for 30 years, uh, since in many respects, it does pull together work that I've been doing over the course of my academic career, uh, going back to my dissertation and first book on the Louisiana sugar uh, region, um, the work that I did on the Freedmen and Southern Society project, uh, some of which I actually got to actually to revisit in working um, on this book. Um, my teaching at LSU uh, before I uh, moved to Stonehill, where I taught um, Louisiana history. Uh, I also taught the class on Reconstruction, which we did separately from the Civil War class. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm incorporating that. Uh, and then when I moved to Stonehill some 16 or 17 years ago, um, I developed a, a, a seminar on Abraham Lincoln, where I really began to immerse myself more fully in the literature on Lincoln. Um, I also teach a class on abolitionist and pro-slavery thought. And so it's, um, you know, where I really be, was able to more familiarize myself with, with what the abolitionists were saying, in addition to the pro-slavery theorists. So all of these things um, come together uh, in, uh, uh, in this book. Um, okay, so that's kind of, you know, the, the background. Uh, the two main arguments in, or two main points that I am putting forward in this book. Uh, the first one is that, uh, is that this area uh, can very much um, uh, encapsulate the multifaceted process um, of emancipation um, and abolition uh, in the South as a whole. And there are five different dimensions of this, will I, which I will go over uh, in turn. So that's the first main idea. The second main idea is to offer a little bit of a reinterpretation and look a little bit differently at the well-known process of how the Civil War becomes, at least for the North, a war initially to preserve the Union and not to abolish slavery, to a war for freedom. Uh, that is a well-known um, uh, theme and topic, in, in, in indeed one of the central topics in the scholarship on the Civil War, is how the war gets transformed from a war for union to a war for freedom. And I think that the Lower Mississippi Valley and what's going on, I think, can help us maybe uh, reinterpret uh, that process. So those are the two big ideas that I'm trying to get 
across in this book. Before doing that, though, I realized that I should have, um, I, I did want to show one of the other maps. This is a slightly different way of looking at this region. Uh, this is the slave population um, in this region, just to give you a sense of what this region looks like. The darker the shading, uh, the more prevalent of uh, the slave population. The darkest is more than 50%. I probably could have broke this down even further, particularly in the uh, more than 50% category because some of these uh, counties and parishes along the Mississippi River um, are upwards of 75, 80, even 90% slave. Uh, but this is just to give you a quick uh, sense of the demographics in this region. Uh, this Arkansas audience will of course recognize the, the, the regional bifurcation there. Uh, the area to the south and to the east is kind of Delta and Delta oriented. Whereas when you get to the west and the north, it's more hill country and mountainous, uh, with the exception, of course, of the Arkansas River region, which runs horizontally uh, and does have some significant slave holdings. Uh, so that, in a way, is is the is the you know in 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 a nutshell of uh, the demographic profile um, of the state. Let's look at this map, and you don't necessarily need to be able to read the text in the um, in the legend at the top because I'm going to run through this. Um, and explain what some of these what, what these lines are trying to uh, to indicate. Um, but the first main theme, the multifaceted process of emancipation and abolition um, in uh, the Lower Mississippi Valley. Um, and again, there are five things going on here. Firstly, we can talk about limited military emancipation. And what I mean by that is um, prior to the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, that is emancipation that was done by military forces under the Confiscation Acts, uh, but was designed to be limited. It was not universal. It didn't apply everywhere. Uh, now, the intention was for this, uh, this form of emancipation to be limited and targeted. For instance, the Confiscation Acts made the distinction between, or at least the second one did, between um, loyal and disloyal slaveholders. So limited emancipation was supposed to be uh, uh, targeted. That's the first. The second one is we have universal military emancipation. And that's the area that's kind of the, the sort of teeth-like marks here. Um, th this is areas where um, uh, emancipation uh, occurred under the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, it was not universal as in everywhere through that, throughout the United States, but universal in the sense in that it was universal emancipation in the areas where the proclamation applied. So first it's limited uh, emancipation, and that was really in these shaded areas. These are the areas of um, federal military occupation right up to the um, announcing or the implementation of the Emancipation Proclamation in January of 63. Then we have universal military emancipation. And that's in the areas, all, all of Arkansas, all of Mississippi, most of Louisiana. Thirdly, we have the exclusions from the proclamation because of what was going on in terms of wartime reconstruction. And the inclusions are the areas um, that are identified by the um, vertical white lines. So all of Tennessee and Southern Louisiana. And as you can see, the exclusions in Southern Louisiana overlap with the military uh, um, area, but also it applies to areas that were strictly speaking not under military uh, control at the time the proclamation was issued. So thirdly is the ex are the exclusions. Then fourthly, we have state level abolition uh, during the war. And that applied in Arkansas, Louisiana, um, and Tennessee. And that's illustrated by the diagonal, uh, the diagonal lines running in the, in the one direction. So that's state level abolition uh, by free state unionists as part of the process of wartime reconstruction. Uh, and then fifthly, we have um, federal abolition under or abolition under federal civilian dictate after the war. And that's Mississippi. But then also that's also under the uh, auspices of the 13th Amendment, uh, which applied universally throughout the Confederate States and all of the states and all um, of, um, of the United States. So this map right here, in a way, kind of articulates this first main theme of the multifaceted process of emancipation. And I think this map really kind of 
shows um, you know, the complexities and how emancipation worked and didn't work. Um, in no other state or region of the Confederacy do we have all five um, of these dimensions of emancipation um, and abolition. Uh, you have some of them going on in other places, but in no other area do you have all five of these things um, going on. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen since we don't really need to necessarily refer to the map. I may I can come back to it um, as necessary. The second main point that I that I'm trying to get forward in this in this book, and this is a little bit more complicated, and it's admittedly going to be a little bit more challenging for me to summarize succinctly. But what I want to do is to offer a reinterpretation of this process of how the union the war goes from a war for union to a war for freedom. I realize again that this might sound a little bit egotistical and hubristic to suggest that I'm going to do something that has never been done before in the vast literature on emancipation. But I think that there has maybe something a little bit maybe missing from uh, the standard uh, the standard account. Most of the uh, of the scholarship on emancipation and abolition. Uh, understandably focuses on the process by which the Emancipation Proclamation comes about. Uh, and again, there's a universe of scholarship on this and on Lincoln and Lincoln's thinking and how we get from a war simply to preserve the Union in the summer of 61 to Lincoln coming to decide that he has to issue the Emancipation Proclamation by the late summer or by the summer of 1862. And so there's a universe of scholarship on that. But then much of the scholarship, again, not all, there are important exceptions, but much of the scholarship then, once we get to the Emancipation Proclamation, then it's almost like everything that happens after that is almost a matter, it's almost like an afterthought, it's a matter of logistics, it's not as important. And the thinking is that once we get to the Emancipation Proclamation, then we've, we've crossed the Rubicon, if you will. And assuming we have Northern military victory, which was not necessarily a done deal, uh, but assuming that the North won the war after the Emancipation Proclamation, then slavery is basically dead. And I'm trying to suggest that it's, it's not quite as simple as, as that. And in point of fact, um, getting from military emancipation, the Emancipation Proclamation, Proclamation to constitutional abolition in many respects was just as difficult and just as complicated um, and, and equally as important as the initial process, getting to the Emancipation uh, Proclamation. If I can show, illustrate, um, uh, kind of in, in, in very concrete terms, uh, most books on emancipation, if you looked at them and if you looked at the, the, the ratio, most books, bo books would spend like this much on the Emancipation Proclamation and then this much on the three years that it takes to get from January 63 until December of 65. It's almost logistics. My book rather is getting to emancipation, the proclamation relatively quickly, but then the meat of the book is the problem of getting from emancipation to abolition. Now, I'm not, I don't claim to be the first person to do this, but there's been some very good scholarship on the, emancip uh, on the 13th Amendment. And in many respects, I use Michael Vorenberg's excellent book on the 13th Amendment as, as in man many respects a guide. And I see my book as more kind of supplementing his argument, not actually trying to contradict his argument. But his book, by definition, really is dealing with the 13th Amendment and the politics of the amendment. And he has some discussion of the, of the political and intellectual background. But what I, I'm doing here is trying to maybe show how that transition, how we get to abolition, because it wasn't necessarily a done deal. We often assume, and even the scholarship often does this, we assume that the 13th Amendment or some kind of con federal constitutional prohibition uh, eliminating slavery had always been part of the plan. And we automatically think that. And the way we think about the Constitution and the way we think about political change and carrying out political, uh, you know, political objectives today, we automatically think the Constitution, whether it's pro-abortion or anti-abortion or gun control or flag burning or whatever the case may be, we have to change the Constitution. Well, as Vorenberg showed, Americans did not think in terms of changing the Constitution uh, before the Civil War to carry out change. 
everybody, with some exceptions, just about everybody thought that the way to get rid of slavery is the states would abolish uh, would abolish slavery. And that, in, in a way, was one of the central challenges that the abolitionists faced, is how to convince the slave states to abolish slavery on their own, voluntarily. The idea of imposing against their will federally mandated abolition against the will of this of the slave states is not there were a few exceptions to that but that's not the way the abolitionists or americans thought so we have to try to envision the very practical problem of assuming military victory how are you going to get the, the states back without slavery but without some kind of federal mandate, right? We have to kind of for a moment try to forget about not some of the 13th Amendment, but even the very idea of using the power of the federal government to mandate political change. Freeing slaves through military means as a means of suppressing rebellion is one thing. Using the power of the federal government to intervene in the internal affairs of the, of the states, that eventually does happen with the 13th Amendment, but that was not part of the plan. That came out of the tumult of, of, of trying to deal with this question of how are we going to preserve the union and make sure that the slave states don't come back with, uh, with slavery. Uh, there was the, what was known as the federal consensus, the idea that the states were protected from federal interference on the question of slavery. Lincoln subscribed to that until very late in the war. Again, Vorenberg demonstrates conclusively that's that that's how many Americans thought for the first two years um, of the war, so how are we going? To, how are we going to get rid of slavery and bring the states back in without this federal mandate? Um, and that's kind of what is going on in wartime Reconstruction as the federal military makes gains, uh, capturing New Orleans, capturing um, uh, Nashville, and, and parts of Tennessee, and even capturing parts of um, of Arkansas um, during uh, during the war. To make matters more complicated, not so much in Arkansas, but in Tennessee and Louisiana, as part of the process of wartime reconstruction, you actually have a, an organized group of what were called conservative unionists, pro-slavery unionists, right? These are unionists. Some of these people had been former Confederates, and then after the, un the feds come and take over, they, they revert back to their unionism for the, for the specific purpose of preserving slavery. So what you have, again, not so much in Arkansas, but in, particularly in Tennessee and Louisiana in 63 and 64, is you have the contest between different unionist factions, free state unionists and pro-slavery unionists, who are competing and vying for control of the uh, state reorganization process. And pro-slavery unionists are undertaking to try to organize loyal pro-slavery governments and to, to petition the return of their uh, states back into the union while preserving slavery. Now, this may seem real unrealistic to us today. Once the genie, as it were, is out of the bottle, you can't reestablish slavery. But we only know that because of the benefit of hindsight. People at the time, both pro and anti-slavery, were very much aware of the possibility of, of the states trying to come back. Certainly the, the Northern Democrats were all for that. They opposed an abolitionist war. Uh, and so this is what I'm dealing with. This really makes up the, the heart and the contents um, of, uh, of the book. Now, Arkansas does have a version of kind of radical unionists and more conservative unionists, but they're not really necessarily thinking in terms of preserving slavery. And I'll get into that a little bit more when I talk about the particular uh, Arkansan dimensions um, of this of this story. Um, but what, what, what much of my book is really showing, you know, trying to, to show the different ways that um, free state unionists, particularly in Tennessee and Louisiana, were dealing with the question of the possibility of slavery surviving the war, how Lincoln and congressional, uh, congressional Republicans uh, are dealing uh, with this problem. They do eventually come up with a, you know, a, a, a way of dealing with this. But again, it's not the 13th Amendment. It's going to be through a Reconstruction Bill, Reconstruction legislation, 
which using the provision of the Constitution guaranteeing Republican government to the states, that's the principle that they will latch onto. The, the goal is to pass a reconstruction bill that will require the seceded states to enact free state constitutions as the price of returning to the union. This is what happens later on in radical reconstruction in 1867, but by then, and that's a different story, but, but it's the same kind of process. What are the, uh, what are the provisions that the Southern states are going to, um, to have to meet? But this is very much in keeping with, um, with traditional notions of federalism, not mandated by the federal government, but essentially the states under the control of free state unionists um, enacting free state uh, constitutions. And in a very, very long, complicated story, that's what this book is about, is dealing with all of that, how that process um, uh, gets worked out. In fact, uh, Republicans will very much, and I, and I kind of borrow this idea from Vorenberg, but Republicans will really actually come to think of the 13th Amendment as part of a, when they finally do get around to some kind of federal um, mandate, they think of it in terms as part of a legislative package with, reconstru with reconstruction legislation that will deal with all of the other practical problems of state restoration. Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to vote? Who's going to hold office? What are we going to do about the Confederate debts? In addition to the question of what is the status of the former slaves going to be? So if anything, Republicans, even when they do get around to in December of 1863, moving toward a federal constitutional amendment, even then it's thought not as a standalone measure. The amendment is not a standalone measure. It's part of a legislative pro uh, package that will require a reconstruction bill to deal with all of the practical problems of state restoration. Again, we tend to think today that the 13th Amendment had been the plan all along, and the 13th Amendment was introduced to give constitutional sanction to the Emancipation Proclamation because the proclamation was a military measure, not a law. But that's not really how it actually happened. There's a whole bunch of stuff in between that has to happen in order to get from military emancipation to, um, to constitutional abolition. Okay, a couple of things. Now, let me just turn for a few moments um, uh, to, and I am running a little bit longer than I had planned, but that's inevitable. But let me just note a couple of things that are really interesting about the Arkansas dimension to this story. Um, because of the military developments, because Little Rock is not captured by Union forces until September of 63, that's really too late for the conservative Unionists to try to preserve slavery. By the fall of 63, the, the, the idea of slavery, the states coming back um, and preserving slavery, that's not going to happen, right? Um, Tennessee and, and, and Southern Louisiana are conquered early enough before the Emancipation Proclamation that it allowed for pro-slavery unionists to begin to organize and mobilize. But that doesn't happen in Arkansas. So Arkansas is the one state of the four states that has wartime reconstruction and you have radical and conservative factions, but it's not really about preserving slavery per se. The conservatives would have loved to have preserved slavery, but it's just not going to happen by this point. Um, the Arkansas story is actually really interesting um, in the spring of 64, when the free state forces mobilize, they organize, they hold a convention, they hold congressional and state elections. And I have to confess, when I first started doing this, I was not familiar with the Arkansas dimension of this story. And it's really, really interesting what's going on um, in, uh, in Arkansas. And it's really complicated um, and it's really confusing uh, and it's really interesting. Um, but Arkansas, as I'm sure some of you know, Arkansas actually has the distinction of being the first Confederate state to abolish slavery via a constitutional provision that has to be approved by the voters. It was a small number of voters. But Arkansas is the first Confederate state to abolish slavery basically via a popular referendum. Virginia did, the Unionist government of Virginia did at around the same time, but they did not um, submit the Constitution to voter approval. The Constitution just, the convention just declared it to be operative. But Arkansas is the first um, state to do this. Um, and so Arkansas is actually the first state to abolish slavery since New York um, in 1827. So it's really interesting. The other thing I would also note about Arkansas is it's really similar 
to the situation in Louisiana. Uh, there's a lot of important differences between wartime reconstruction in Louisiana and Arkansas, especially because of the free black population in New Orleans. But in other instances, it's very similar. And I was really struck by the, um, by the similarities between wartime reconstruction in Arkansas um, and in Louisiana. Uh, and what Nathaniel Banks is doing, the military commander in Louisiana, who's basically overseeing Reconstruction, and then Fred Frederick Steele um, in Arkansas, um, and and what he's doing with with Arkansas Union is such as a, a Gant, Edward Gant, and Fishback, um, and of course um, Isaac Murphy um, and others. What we really actually need is we need a book on wartime Reconstruction in Arkansas. Uh, there, there really isn't a at least a modern study of, of wartime reconstruction. Carl Moneyhun's book is a, a great book, which I used on the Civil War and Reconstruction period. But we really do actually need a book, just like there are the books um, on Lincoln's reconstruction policy in Louisiana. But we really do need a good book uh, or and, and a modern book on, um, on wartime reconstruction um, in Arkansas. Okay, the fourth thing I want to do is talk a little bit about the, impl Im the, the larger implications, and I didn't leave quite as much time as, uh, as I would like to, to, so I'm going to have to go over this a little bit more quickly the, than I would like, but these are some of the larger issues that I think that this study raises. First of all, the success of the abolitionists. We got rid of slavery, so the abolitionists were right, right? And sometimes some scholars even today will subscribe to the idea that the pressure of the abolitionists provoked the South into undertaking a suicidal war, which resulted in the abolition of slavery. But that was never the abolitionist plan. The abolitionists, they really, they, they really didn't have a viable plan, the abolitionists. They weren't thinking of a federal abolition amendment. Um, and they really had, for all of the stuff that they talked about, and, and I think even the scholarship is sometimes a little bit um, misses this important point, they really didn't have much of a plan. Garrison and his people eschewed politics um, entirely. They really didn't have a viable plan to get over the, the federal consensus, right? And so th this idea that, you know, that the 13th Amendment had been part of the plan all along um, and that the abolitionists ultimately provoked the South into disunion, which then allows Lincoln to free the slaves and end and, and slavery, that's very deterministic. That was not the abolitionist plan. In fact, that was one of the key charges that were leveled against the abolitionists is that they were trying to foment civil war. So that's not the plan. Even if it had been the plan, that plan could have failed because Union military victory was not inevitable. And even if that was the plan, what does that say about change under the Constitution, that we had to ultimately resort to violence um, to end um, slavery? Um, the other thing, another point is slavery in the Constitution. That's very much being debated today. It's always been debated, and even now today, very vibrant debates as to whether the Constitution was a pro-slavery document. I have to confess, I used to subscribe to the idea that it was, but Jim Oakes and Sean Wilentz's book, No Property in Man, I think that they make a persuasive argument that it was not necessarily a pro-slavery document. But that's the problem. That's, that's the tragedy. The Constitution was not necessarily a pro-slavery document, and yet it still had no provision, no way to get rid of slavery. So you don't have to read the Constitution as a pro-slavery document to recognize that it, there was no way to get rid of slavery. Even if the Constitution is not a pro-slavery document, you still, it still has, no, there's no way to get rid of slavery under the Constitution. And I think that's the real tragedy. Not the fact that the founding fathers wrote a pro-slavery constitution, right? There was no way of getting rid of it. Finally, a what if. Like what if, like what if Lincoln had not been assassinated? How would Reconstruction have been different? We always think that. Here's another what if. What if Lincoln had been assassinated? But what if Lincoln and congressional re uh, Republicans had been able to agree on a Reconstruction bill before the end of the war that might have handcuffed what Andrew Johnson can do? Now, Lincoln never wanted to be handcuffed what he could do, and that's part of why he vetoed the Wade Davis bill, the one bill that got through Congress. But what if we have an, an, another kind of alternative outcome, a what if that still allows for Lincoln's assassination, but that what if a Reconstruction bill had been passed, which would very much circumscribe, circumscribe what Andrew Johnson could have done once he becomes president. We still could have had a very different outcome to Reconstruction, but one even still like 
allowing for Lincoln's uh, Lincoln's assassination. I'm going to stop there um, and allow some time for uh, for questions. Uh, I I hope that, that you will have some some questions, and but I hope that nobody has seen maybe some of the holes and weak spots in my argument. Okay, John. Don't know. Is this is this working? Yeah. Not really. Like it's just me being loud, right? Okay. Well, is it working now? I don't hear anything. Okay. <clears throat> I'll just put it down. <laughs> loud enough. Um, John, you are at a disadvantage being virtual. Carl Moneyhun is in the room. Uh oh. So, Doctor Moneyhun, I do believe that was a challenge. No. In modern. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, not at all. Ch ch the challenge was to go home and start writing. Again. Yes, the challenge was to go home and start writing. Exactly. <laughs> I, I heard nothing. I disagree with you. Let me see if I can get this to. Yeah. Can you turn it up a little bit, Dre? Okay. Here. No, I, I. Okay. I have nothing to say. I mean, I said that I, I don't disagree with anything John said. Uh, I, I kind of totally do agree with him, and. Book I wrote, I think, uh, was trying to deal with another issue altogether. And I, mm -hmm. I meant that uh, looking at Reconstruction itself during the war time was kind of the last, the last thing I was looking at. I was more interested in the broader impact of the war in, on, on, in a certain sense, the white population, on the black population, uh, also gets involved. So, no, I, I have no real questions to ask. I thought it, it was a very nice lecture, and I thought. Uh, uh, again, I don't disagree with anything John said. Maybe some other people do. <laughs> Questions from the room? Okay, let's see if this is going to work. I'm not a historian necessarily, mm -hmm. although I do political history from time to time. Uh, my perception of the uh, 1787 Constitution was that it was a compromise constitution, not a constitution that necessarily endorsed slavery. So I was a little perplexed by your, your comment about that. And um, as a kind of an aside, um, it reminded me of the 1864 Arkansas Constitution, which I thought was an interesting document that I hadn't really reviewed in a long time. Um, but it was, in effect, the Civil War Constitution, and it recognized, I think, the idea that I think slavery could have been abolished at that particular point under that document. They definitely had, did. Yeah. Now, you had an 1868 Constitution. You also had a Reconstruction Constitution. Mm -hmm. So we've had a lot of evolutionary constitutionalism in this state. And I'm not sure I have a real question, but I was just kind of perplexed by your your view of the 1787 Constitution and that perspective, because you had 13, 14, and 15, and they came as a unit. And I think what your book does, which I obviously haven't read, is put a lot of uh, a lot of detail and a lot of analysis to that. And so I think somebody needs to write that. I think to my right, Mark Pris, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think Professor Moni has an interest in doing that right now. Not now. I've got other thoughts. <laughs> Yeah. So let, let me go ahead and elaborate upon that a little bit. You know, I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on some of the names, and I know some of the scholars who may be listening could probably, but no, I mean, they're, they're, this is a very well-developed um, thought. I mean, it's there are still scholars and, and historians and legal scholars who are making this argument today that the Constitution was a pro-slavery document. It's sometimes been characterized as neo-Garrisonian, kind of buying, you know, the William Lloyd Garrison, who famously did consider what, what did he famously called it a, a, a compact with death and a deal with the devil or, or the hell or something like that, but that it was clearly a pro-slavery document. William Lloyd Garrison wanted the, the free states to secede from a pro-slavery union, right? So this is actually a, a pretty familiar idea, right? And 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 even in, in today's you know scholarly debates, there is a, a well-developed you know argument that it was a pro, that it wasn't really a compromise, it was a pro-slavery document. And, and, and the work of James Oakes and, and particularly Sean Wilentz's No Property in Man is clearly arguing you know, against that idea, going back to this idea that it was a compromise 
um, you know, a recognition that we can't get rid of slavery, but eventually we will, but that the spirit of the Constitution was infused with anti-slavery sentiments, right? And that even, even enslaved people were not considered property in the Constitution. They were, they were persons who occupied a status, right? So, so this idea is, is actually fairly well, well developed. But again, I, I think I, I, I've changed my view on this. And I think, I think Oaks and Wilentz are right. But I still think that the tragedy is that even, again, as I said, even though it's, it's not a pro-slavery constitution, it allowed no mechanism for getting rid of it if the states don't want to do it. That's, that's the problem. How are you going to convince the states, the, the slave states, to get rid of slavery voluntarily? And the eight, the eight, the constitute the this, the Arkansas 1864 Constitution does un, un, unequivocally abolish slavery. There was no ambiguity about it. It didn't request like all of the other free state constitutions during the war. Um, it didn't it didn't address the question of black political and legal rights. It kicked that down that that can further down the road, but it got rid of slavery. Okay, we have a couple of questions on Zoom. Um, Shirley Hill asks, after the referendum in Arkansas, was there resistance, a continuation of slavery? Oh, totally. Absolutely, because, because um, uh, um, ostensibly federal control over Arkansas by the spring of 64 extended pretty much over most of the state. Confederate, the Confederate authority prevailed in really only about the, um, the, the, um, uh, the about a third of the um, in, in southwestern Arkansas. That was the area that was still where the Confederate government prevailed. In most of the rest of the of Arkansas, at least ostensibly, was under the control of federal authorities. But much of it, that control was very precarious. Once you got outside of Little Rock and some of the other main um, towns um, and cities, federal control was very precarious. And so. I mean, it was it was a, a much of it a wasteland anyway because uh, because of the war. But that was a major problem. I mean, that's going to be a major problem of these unionist governments. I mean, they, in a way, they kind of are rump governments, right? Uh, but they are the official governments that the federal government recognizes. So there was there was you know still a lot of guerrilla warfare, a, a lot of uh, opposition uh, to uh, to um, uh, uh, to these governments, and in areas where where federal control is weak. There is still slavery, um, and part of what I do also in this book is show how you know there's the politics, but there's the on the on the ground stuff, and that's also being you know contested. Um, and so, um, you know, this is this is a very very messy uh, situation to make a very complicated to boil it down, you know, to it to its to its essentials. Okay, Shirley Hill has another question: Were there policies to reorganize slave labor? Um, I, it, uh, I'm not, yes and no, it depends on which perspective oh. we're talking about. Uh, again, in the areas that are under federal control, um, and this is, this goes on, not just in Arkansas, but everywhere under federal authority, um, uh, federal military and, and also treasury department, department officials assume responsibility for implementing what we would think of as quasi free labor systems systems of compensated labor. They're not free labor the way it was understood in the North or the way we would understand it today, but it's it's kind of a halfway period of uh, situation between slavery um, and, uh, and and non-slave labor. Uh, so there are, I mean, and, and this is one of the main themes that I, that I deal with in the book, and I have several chapters that are devoted specifically to this problem of the disintegration of slavery on the plantations and how that's getting worked out in the countryside, in the conflicts between former slaveholders and former slaves, in the reconstitution um, of the um, of the plantation system. But what I also have, and it, it is extraordinary, one of the things, um, the, the, one of the, the the main themes here is the extent to which the slaveholders were determined to hold on to slavery, even in late 1864, after Lincoln has been reelected, and once Lincoln is reelected then it's game over. Slavery has no hope at this point. The amendment is not necessarily a done deal, but there's no way that slavery is going to survive once Lincoln is reelected. But even then, 
slaveholders in, in, in Arkansas and elsewhere are doing everything they can to hold on to their slaves, to re-enslaved people who have gained freedom, and to preserve the institution of slavery. Uh, ERS Canby, the military commander for much of the, of the lower Mississippi Valley, has to issue an order uh, in late 1864 saying, watch out, right? These people, the, the slaveholders, they're, they are, they're doing everything they can to return their slaves to, to slavery, to move back into the interior beyond the reach of federal military authorities. Um, and so, and like even after the war, even after the war is over in remote parts of, 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 of this area, they're still trying to hold on, on to slavery. So one of my main themes, and I'm not making a moral judgment here. This is this, I mean, this was the slaveholders. They were, they were committed with every fiber of their being to slavery. Now, some of them make the adjustment, some move on, but many of them are just absolutely determined to hold on to their to their institution. And again, this is not a moral judgment. This is a historical assessment. Any more questions from the room? Well, John, thank you very much. Um, this is, I did have the book to hold up. Huh. I to do it. So there is the book. Um, and I haven't quite gotten to the man's page. I have started reading it. Um, I'm about 100 pages in. So, um, but it is it is well written. It's it's very interesting. Um, so I did some work on northeastern Louisiana plantations, and so I'm enjoying that part um, immensely. So, well, thank you very much. I really do appreciate yes. it. Thank you for joining us for Massachusetts. Okay, so next month we will be joined by Josh Parfell to talk about digital history and Jewish Arkansas. So mark your calendars for Wednesday, October 4th at noon. We'll be back here at UA Little Rock downtown. Um, if you come in person, you'll get a free cookie. If you join virtually on Zoom, you don't get a free cookie. Um, I'm really working on getting our in person, like, cookie, y'all. Um, and on a final note, please make plans to join us Saturday, October 7th for our all-day annual genealogy workshop. We're going to um, have Civil War historian, genealogist, and Little Rock native Ronnie Nichols um to come and speak he's gonna spend the whole day with us he will be in person um so i hope to see everybody next month for these two great events and thank you for joining us today thank you thank you john okay thank you have a great day thank you you too Hi. Yeah, right.